We are all the bad guy in someone else's story, warranted or not, because the enemy is deceptive. And when people are on that side of life, they can't see the truth. Everything that they view is skewed. Hello, angels. Happy Wednesday. How is everybody feeling today? I am just really hoping and praying that this episode really touches you, that it really encourages you, because I feel like where we're at right now in life is we're at a bit of a crossroads. If you are someone that is spiritually sensitive, it's almost like, you know, if you know, you know, sort of thing. And I feel like where we're at right now spiritually is there are a lot of people that are going through so much hardship, so much adversity, and they are just at the end of themselves. And that is a beautiful place to be. And so that's why I titled this, God, I'm at the end of myself. And I feel like that is where we can allow God to do the best work in us. And it's such a sacred place to be. And I want to just talk about the beautiful, the beauty in surrendering and being obedient to God. And so firstly, in John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I know that that sounds like, okay, like, so what does that exactly mean? But whenever you love somebody, you want the best for them, right? When you love somebody, you want to treat them the best. You want them to have the best experiences. Like a child, you have a child, you want that child to eat the best foods. You want that child to have the best clothing, Um, you know, all these different things. You just want the best as their guardian. And that is exactly how God is with us. He wants the best. And so if your child says, I want to touch this hot iron and you, you know, say, no, you cannot touch that. It's very, very hot. And they're like, I don't understand why I can't touch it because they're, they're babies, you know, or whatever they're young. And so you might like swat their hand away. Like, you know, like tap their hand, you know, no, don't do that. No. And they might like cry you know, like I want to do this. And it's like, they think you're being unfair because you're the way they see it is you just are getting in the way of me doing what it is that I want to do. But you see it as this is going to harm you. I'm going to do whatever it takes to protect you from said thing. And so when you think about that, that's how it is with us and our relationship with God. And I think we have to get to a place where we are at the end of ourselves and we're like, God, I'm done. I'm giving everything to you. And I, this is something that I feel like I've experienced myself in my journey and in my walk, you know, with Christ is like, I'm tired of doing everything on with on my own strength, you know, even in the midst of the storm, because you're going to have storms, right? That goes without saying you're going to have storms, even in the midst of the storm. I still find that I have peace in the midst of certain storms, as opposed to trying to go about it any other way and thinking that if I, you know, you know, read this book or I wear this crystal, or if I do this, then all my problems are going to go away. And that's not how it's going to work. When you love someone, you're going to follow that up with action. And this is why in James uh, 1 verse 22, it says, but be doers of the word and not hearers only deceiving yourselves. If you hear something and you don't adhere to it, you're only deceiving yourself. And I think that is so powerful because it kind of goes back to the analogy of, okay, we, we all know what to and not to do, right? We know what foods are good and what foods are bad. We know that McDonald's isn't the healthiest thing for us, but we're deceiving ourselves if we're going to constantly go there and we're not going and we expect for life to just turn out to be great. If you live a lifestyle that's full of fast, quick and easy and cheap food, you're going to feel not the best. Like it just goes without saying love. Like I said, it's an action word. So when you love someone or you love something, you're going to do anything for that person. You're going to do anything to get that thing that you want. So in order for us to be at the end of ourselves and be like, God, I surrender everything to you, we have to be disciples. And so the definition of disciple actually, um, stems it's an ancient word um it stems from in um back in the day where people needed to hear a teacher so if you followed a teacher and you tried to live like that 
teacher, that was called being a disciple of that person. You were called a disciple of that teacher. So when we say that Jesus is looking for disciples, right? We're looking, Jesus is looking for doers and not only hearers of the word only. Your walk with God is essentially useless if it's not going to translate um, in the way that you live and in the way that you treat others. You know, and a lot of the times we deceive ourselves in our own heart when we disregard the reality of of, of that and, when, and what walking with God actually looks like. And that's not to say I think what scares people is they tend to think, oh, this means like, so I'm never supposed to ever sin again and all these different things. You know, this is what's interesting. I was watching Janine Amapola and her husband's podcast called Happy and Healthy. And one thing that I literally thought that like, it's like the spirit is moving so much because the exact same analogy is reminds me of the podcast episode that I filmed the other day where I was saying that, isn't it interesting how the devil literally says like, you could do whatever you want, yet we're still miserable. So what she was saying was the devil literally will minimize the degree of the things that you're doing. Oh, you want to go like sin? You want to go like, you know, um, smoking and drinking and, and fornicating all these different things? Go do it. Then as soon as you feel convicted about it in your heart, then he's shaming you. Do you really think God is going to forgive you after what you just did? You should be ashamed of yourself. So the devil, he, she said, he minimizes the sin, but then maximizes the sin after you feel convicted of it. And the devil actually is the number one um, condemner. It's actually not God. God is not the one condemning. It is actually the devil that's condemning. It's the devil that's giving you those thoughts because God forgives us for all these different things. And that doesn't mean that we should abuse grace. It is, again, when you are in relationship with someone, you're not going to do whatever because you know you can. Because you have a relationship with that person, you're going to you're going to want to do right by them. It's the same thing that applies to your relationship with Christ. So you're going to want to do things that are pleasing to God because of the relationship that you have with him. You're not going to be like, oh, well, God's going to forgive me. Oh, God's going to forgive me and abuse grace. There are thresholds to grace. No one knows really what that is, but who wants to experiment with that? You understand? But the devil, on the contrary, he's going to make you feel like very shameful, very guilty for the things that you've done. He's going to loop those things thoughts in your head over and over again. Oh yeah, well, you had a kid already. You're not even married. No one's ever going to want to be with you. Or, you know, you had a kid already uh, outside of marriage. Um, you know, there's no way that anyone's ever going to want to have another kid with you again, or you're not going to get married to your baby. Who even knows? But these are the things that the devil puts in our brains. And, and, and whenever we want to change, he dangles them in front of our faces. Oh, that's convenient. You want to devote your life to Christ? Huh, okay, well, um, what about the fact that you were just gossiping with so-and-so on the phone literally a week ago? What about the fact that you were, you know, engaging in activities you shouldn't have been engaging in, you know, uh, last month? Um, you really think you're that different now, girl? And if you think about it, the devil utilizes different people because the world is Satan's playground. We we are in the world right now. This is this is the world. It's 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 Satan's playground, and he uses people that they don't realize they are di his disciples. Essentially, they are they. He uses people to condemn us to us. So this is why you'll have friends. They don't realize it because it sounds harsh, but they're operating on demonic principle or satanic principle where they become the condemners. Look at her. She thinks she's better than us because she started reading her Bible. She's, she didn't change. She didn't, she's not really about that. She's just doing this for this reason. And you find that the people that reject Christ the most, they tend to be the most judgmental people a lot of the times. Now, that's not to say a lot of Christians aren't judgmental, but that's what I'm saying. If you have a true relationship with God, you we all fundamentally understand that we are not the judge of people. So anytime you have people that want to do things in the name of Christ and or or unalive people in the name of anything, that is not that is not what any anything to do with Christianity. That is not what Christianity stands for in any capacity. 
So that's not true. You can't have a relationship, you know, with, with God. And these are, this is how you're acting because it's going to produce something called the fruit. It's going to produce the fruit of God's spirit, produce the fruit of the spirit, love, patience, joy, kind, long kindness, long suffering, et cetera, et cetera. It's going to produce these things. And that's what I urge all of you to understand that people that are in relationship with God are going to be the people that are the, that are going to show you the fruits of their relationship with God. You know, yes, I forgive you for what you said about me. Yes, I forgive you for what you did to me. Does that mean you have to sail off into the sunset and, and, and be best friends with that person? No, but the fruit is you let it go. You're not holding on to it. You're not going to allow it to make you jaded for the, for, you know, for, every other experience that you have, and you're creating more and more victims. There was an analogy that I really like that I want to share with you guys, where it said that Jesus used the same point of being um, doers and not hear only hearers of the word, where he was talking about his sermon on the mount. And he said that the one who heard the word without doing it was like a man who built his house on sand. But the one who hears God's word was like a man whose house was built on a rock. So the one who heard and did God's word could withstand the inevitable storms of life and the judgment of eternity. And obviously the person who built their house on sand, what happens? Storms come, floods come. Your foundation, the foundation in which your house was built upon is shaky and it's rocky. But if you built your house up on a rock, which is a stable thing, Thing. like Jesus is the foundation. God is the foundation. It's going to help you weather those storms. You're going to have peace in the midst of those storms. And another verse I think is interesting because when it comes to following our walk, we have to understand that there are going to be all types of people out there and Christians and the world judges Christians very, very, very harshly, you know, because there are people that in the name of Christianity still do not produce the fruit that is appropriate for people that are in true relationship with Christ. So in Matthew 7, verse 21, it says that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my father who is in heaven. So this means just because someone's proclaiming all this, you know, being Christian and I'm this and I'm holier than thou and, and et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to heaven because it's the one who actually follows the will of God that is actually going to heaven, not doing it for vanity metrics, like a Pharisee, not the, the people who live on legalistic Christian views, obedient children. Okay. Do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, AKA this is in first Peter uh, one verse 14. Once you know better, you have to do better. Don't be conformed to your former ignorance. And I know that it's hard sometimes because you, you can know something is wrong and you still go and do it. We know McDonald's is bad, but we still eat it. But eventually, like when you truly like sell out to God, you have to say, listen, I really am struggling with this thing. I really need your help. I'm at the end of myself. I need you to help me get over and overcome this. I need your guidance. I need your super supernatural strength in my life to help me overcome this thing. And he will move for you. When you truly sell out to God, he's going to show you his mighty hand. He's going to show you the power in his life. Listen, I've been through so much adversity and things like that. Things you would have never assumed that I may have experienced. And I let the fruit of my relationship with God speak for me. I don't need to talk about it. I don't need to brag about it. My character speaks for itself. That in the midst of any sort of adversity, I'm going to hold on to my relationship with God and let God be my vindicator in every situation all the time. Even if it looks like I'm losing, even if it looks like I'm getting hit, 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 left, right, front and center, I'm still going to hold on to God's promises and let God be the vindicator for me. I will never allow my experiences with people or what have you completely ruin my relationship that I have with God, because essentially that means you just don't really have one. You know, if someone were to walk up to you and say, you know, um, I saw your man like looking at another girl or something like that. 
you're not going to be like, oh, well, he's down the drain. <laughs> you, you know what? You you can have him. Like, you're not going to be that drastic. You're not going to give that up. Even when you have a job, there are people that want to remove you from a certain position. You know, there are people that feel like you don't deserve the things that you have. Are you going to just give up your career because Susie over there doesn't feel like you deserve the promotion to be her boss? You can throw your job away, but that's how we act as Christians where, or people that don't want to get into Christianity, how they act is, oh, well, that's why I don't go to church. That's why I don't want to go. You know, uh, I don't want to, I don't believe in that or whatever, uh, because, or they'll say things, they'll speak against themselves. Oh, I could never get to that level. So I, why are you speaking that over yourself? Why are you doing that to yourself? In Romans eight twenty eight, it says that, and we know that those who love God, all things work together for good for those that are called according to his purpose. You know, my goal essentially with you guys is to make the Bible seem more relatable and fun. Because as you guys can see, like just because I talk about this stuff doesn't mean that my personality has been eradicated. I'm still Asia Christina. I I'm still Asia Christina Foster. Like me proclaiming, you know, and standing on this hill and saying, okay, like Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. It's my personality hasn't gone with with the fact that I've become more vocal about the fact that I'm Christian. I've always been a Christian. So I don't know who uh, who else is new here trying to, you know, that we're shocked by that reality. But no, I've always been. I've always been a Christian. I've always believed in Jesus Christ. Um, I'm just more vocal about it now. Yes. Okay. So this scripture in James 1 verses 2 to 4, this is talking about faith and endurance. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm reading from the New Living Translation. When troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. Anytime now being seasoned, more seasoned in my, in my faith journey, I'm like, anytime there's extreme adversity, I'm thanking God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Because I know that around the corner, something great's about to happen. When all hell breaks loose, I know my miracles around the corner. And I know it seems so weird to do that. And, but I'm telling you, that's how, you know, like I always bring it back to this example, Jesus was literally persecuted and he was a sinless person and people had so much negative things to say about him. We are sinners. People are going to have things to say about us at the end of the day. Any, we are all the bad guy in someone else's story warranted or not. We're all the bad guy because the enemy is deceptive. And when people are on that side of life, they can't see the truth. Everything that they view is skewed. So they will easily persecute someone that's trying to live right, that's trying to do their best. And they have so much garbage and things to say about them because it's a reflection of how they feel about themselves. So they have nothing but hate and vitriol to spew out at another person that's trying to do the right thing, that's trying to live right. People can demonize anyone and anything for any reason. Here you are trying to read your Bible and people demonize that. Oh, so you think you're better than me? Huh? No. Yeah, you do because you're reading your Bible at home when you could just be out partying with us. You don't want to go out partying with us. Oh, because you think you're different than me? What are you, like a Jesus girl now? Do you see how you, that's that's the type of stuff that the enemy does? Because people want to drag you down to whatever level that they're at so that they don't have to feel so different than you. That's what they do. And then you'll have people that have this counterfeit spirit. They act like everything's okay that you're doing, but behind your back, they're talking about you. They have an issue with what you're doing, but they're not strong enough to actually say any of these things to your face. So what they're going to do instead is they're going to talk about it to everybody else and judge you. But to your face, they want to act like they respect your journey and they understand and they're engaging with you on behalf of certain conversations. You're thinking that, wow, like they're changing, like this is awesome. But really, they're deceiving themselves because the spirit's going to reveal it eventually, or as the world likes to call it, the vibes, the vibes are going to be off. Back to what I was saying, we're this is verse three, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. Verse four, so let it grow for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete needing nothing. Like I love this script. I love the chapter of James 
And it's just full of so many gems. It even goes uh, forward into saying, if you need wisdom, verse five, ask our generous God and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking. But when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Okay. And I love that scripture because it says, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, right? Faith is tested through trials. It's not produced by trials. Let me say that again. Faith is tested through trials. It is not produced by trials. Trials reveal to us what faith we have, not because God doesn't know how much faith we have, but so that our faith will be evident to ourselves and those around us. So this is what we have to notice. When our faith is being tested, it shows that faith is clearly very important and precious. And because of that, precious things are going to be tested thoroughly. Faith is vital to salvation, vital to the body. And that's why the enemy is aimed at trying to make people lose faith. He, he wants to blind people from having any sort of belief in God because it actually works. If trials do not produce faith, then what exactly does? Well, in Romans 10 verse 17, it says that, so then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Supernaturally, faith is built in us as we hear, understand, and trust in in God's word. So James essentially didn't want us to think that God sends trials to break us down or destroy our faith, but he wanted us to come back to the point in James 1, uh, 13 through 18. Okay. It's going to produce patience. Okay. Trials do not produce faith, but when trials are received with faith, it's going to produce patience. Okay. And difficulties are received in, 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 you know, if the difficulties are received in, in grumbling and complaining and all these different things, the trials can actually produce. OK, this is a key note here. They, it can produce discouragement and bitterness. If you don't hang on to faith in these moments of adversity, you can easily find yourself becoming bitter and discouraged. And this is why it, James says to count it all joy. Counting it all joy is the response when you are experiencing trial. Nobody ever hates on something that is not threatening. And that is something I had to learn. Here I am, la -di -di -di, living my life, thinking nothing of it, thinking I'm a, I'm a good person. Like, I don't bother anybody. I don't gossip about people. Like, I'm genuinely a good person. And, you know, like, that's not to say you want to like have like little chats stuff like that with your friends here and there. But I'm not like known as a gossipy person. Like if you know me personally, you know, I'm not like that. And so, you know, I don't go out of my way to do vindictive things to people. I'm not a vindictive person. I'm just not. I'm a very even keeled person. Like I, nothing really bothers me really that much. Like, you know, sometimes it hurt, it like it offends people that I'm always so just like chill about things, you know, but I am on fire for Christ. I'm passionate about that. So there's that. Um, but anyways, you would never think that like I would have gone through the situations that I've gone through because I'm thinking like, I've never done anything to anyone to warrant, you know, said behavior. So like, why is this happening? Why is this person saying this about me? Why is this person, you know, trying to persecute me? Why does this person have an issue with me? You want, because especially growing up, you want to be liked. Nobody wants to be disliked, you know? And I know now, like, when you are a threat to people, because we are, it's, we are spirits. It is the spirit in you that is affecting them. It is the light in you that is exposing their darkness. It is the light in you. Sometimes people admire you so much that they almost, they hate you at the same time. They have to demonize you. They have to try and trick you and, you know, get you to do things that, that they would do so that they don't feel that you're any different than them. These are going to be the people. Let's say you naturally don't drink. Oh, come on. Just take a shot. Just take a shot. It's not that big of a deal. You're not even going to get that drunk. Like, I'm telling you, honestly, like, I can literally take, like, 10 shots and I'm literally fine. Like, you'll be fine with taking one. Just do it. Just do it. It's not that big of a deal. And you're like, ah, ah, okay, fine. You know what I mean? Next thing you know, you're feeling like not well because you, when you said you don't drink, I mean, you meant you really just don't drink. And like here, this person is the, the seducing spirit, I hate to say it, but it's so true. This seducing spirit that got you to do something and compromise on your beliefs. Can you force them to read the Bible? You see how sin works? Isn't it amazing? People can force you to do all types of, of things, devious things, but you can never force them. And I'm not saying that 
as to as anything bad, but it's like interesting that it's difficult to convince people to do the right thing and and do sober minded things, but it's easy to peer pressure people into, you know, doing sinful things. Interesting. You want to count it as all joy when you are persecuted and people are saying things about you, especially when you surrender and you give your life to Christ. Look at how many people right now. I did not even notice this. I guess I'm one of those people that I'm caught up in the wave of all these YouTubers and I guess celebrities that are all coming to Christ now that are like, listen, like I've seen some things and I want to be on this side. I don't want to be on that side. I've seen what this life can produce. I've seen people that people look up to on the internet and they're nothing of the sort in person. They are the meanest, weirdest people you'll ever meet. But on the internet, everyone loves them and you don't think anything of it. And I'm like, God, like, how is it? You get discouraged sometimes. Like, how is it that certain people can get away with being such bad people in real life? Like in real life, torturous people to be around. Very like mean, evil, vindictive, um, lying, like manipulative. And these people are the most successful people. And I'm like, you know what? So be it. Because I would rather be on this side than be on their side. Because at the end of the day, these people have to sit with themselves. They're not happy people. No matter what success is being achieved, celebrities will tell you this all the time. No matter what success certain people achieve, they're still miserable people deep down. And you can see that by what? The fruit of how they be of how they behave. You could see that by their character. They always have to have a nasty comment about someone. They always have to bring someone down. That is the fruit of where of their heart's posture. And it doesn't lie. It doesn't lie. And this is why I'm saying, like, sometimes I want to encourage you guys. Sometimes it always seems like people are winning until they're just not. Or sometimes it seems like people are, you know, it seems like you're losing until you're just not. Something to consider. I want to also add this. It's occasionally James, he basically asks the readers to enjoy the trials. I know that sounds so crazy, but he didn't say that you have to feel that it's joyful all the time or that all the things that you're going to go through are going to feel amazing. Obviously, they're not. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The work of patience, right, and endurance, it comes slowly, okay, it, so that you can grow and it's going to allow you to bloom. Patience and endurance is the mark of a person that is perfect and complete, lacking nothing. This is why, you know, when you get out of a relationship, the first thing to do is not to go be with someone else immediately, okay, because you need to heal that that the endurance of you choosing to be alone, you know, and choosing to just gather yourself and to reflect on what worked, but didn't for, work, get in the get into the face of God and seek him is what's really going to help you. OK, and if you lack wisdom, OK, what are trials going to do? They're going to be the ne that's going to be the necessary season for you to seek wisdom from God. So when you're going through trials, as tempting as it may be to try and incorporate all these other um, practices that are not of God, try Jesus. This is the time to seek wisdom from God when you were going through the hardest trials in your life. And we don't know all the time that we need wisdom at the, in the face of adversity, but God, he has the ability to give us peace in the midst of the storm. He wants us to persevere in faith. And this requires wisdom. Like I said, if you lack wisdom, it's going to come in the form of trials because trials and tribulations are here to teach us something. A lot of the times we're all ready to jump to books, go to ceremonies, retreats, um, uh, do this ritual, all these different things, everything except for trying God, any and everything except for trying God. But in the Bible, it doesn't say ask books Ask, um, you know, ask the retreat um, uh, uh, leader or whatever. No, it says ask God in order to receive wisdom. It says ask God who gives wisdom generously and liberally. OK, so when I gave you guys that scripture, I was talking about the wave of the sea. Let me see if I can bring it up one more time. Do not waver for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. OK, this is James one versus six. A wave of sea. I want to I want to break this down. and I got this from Enduring Word. It is so good. And it says a wave of the sea is a fitting description of a person that is hindered by unbelief and unnecessary doubts. 
A wave of the sea is without rest, and so is a doubter. A wave of the sea is unstable, and so is a doubter. A wave of the sea is driven by the winds, so is a doubter. They're double-minded. You can They can be here nor there. A wave of the sea is capable of great destruction, and so is a doubter. And so this is like a double-minded person, all right? The man of two souls who has one for earth and the other for heaven, who wishes to secure both worlds, but he won't give up the earth and hates to let heaven go. The man who said to Jesus, Lord, you know, this is what I want to say. I don't, I, I know it's so easy to be so, uh, you know, confused at certain points. God, do you hear me? God, are you there? Like, I feel like you're, I feel like you don't hear me. Why am I going through this? Why is this person doing this to me? Why did this relationship break up? Why didn't I get this promotion? Why is this job not calling me back? Why did this opportunity fall in my lap? And it feels like it just dissipated into thin air as soon as it got here. And it's so easy in these moments, the devil uses pain in order to get us to not believe in God. The devil also uses these, these, these painful experiences on, on, from God's hand, they are trials to give us wisdom. From the devil's hand, he's, he wants to add to those negative thoughts and think, yeah, you see you're going through this. God would not have you going through any sort of trials or anything like that uh, if he really loved you. But trials are going to bring you wisdom because that's a part of life. If there was no reason to go through anything at all in life, then there's no reason for any of this. There's nothing to learn, nothing to do, nothing to strive for, et cetera, et cetera. In these moments where your faith is shaken and you're feeling all over the place, there's a scripture, Mark 9, verse 24. Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And that's not being double-minded. This man wanted to believe and he declared his belief to Jesus but his faith was weak, but it wasn't hindered by being double-minded, but he was saying, God, and this is something for you guys too, and myself, that like, God, I believe, but help my unbelief. I'm going through this. This is so painful. I feel like nobody understands me. I feel like I'm just by myself. I feel like, why am I facing all this persecution? And it's just so difficult. I know what you endured. I know what you went through. And I know you died for my sins, but it's so hard. I feel so lonely. I don't know what to do. I feel like I'm lost. I feel like, can I even really change? What if I go backwards? And I, I don't want to start on this journey because I don't know what this means. What is my life going to look like? Do I have to get rid of these friends? Like, how am I going to tell these people? How am I going to be a different person? And what does my life even look like when this is all that I know? Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. So I want to end with two prayers, right? One is a prayer of surrenderance. And I want you guys to say this, write this down. Okay, I didn't originate this specific prayer, but I think it's very important for you guys to, um, to also repeat. I surrender, you know, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I surrender to you my whole self, my heart, my mind, my memory, my imagination, my will, my emotions, my passions, my body, my sexuality, my desire for human approval, my weaknesses, my desires, my sins. I surrender every person in my life to you. Heal every relationship, mend every broken thing, direct me, guide me, keep me covered under your blood. And I thank you for doing it in the mighty name of Jesus. And I also want to end on this prayer. I'm not sure if you guys know about this. I don't know where you are in your faith journey. I don't know if you are a new person coming to Christ, but I want to give you the opportunity to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So this is called the salvation prayer. The scripture says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And if you would like to know Christ, all you have to do is receive the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ by saying a prayer of salvation. So you don't got to buy a crystal. You don't have to, you know, do a ritual on a rock or anything. It's free. And eventually, yeah, you can get a Bible. But I want you to pray this out loud. Lord Jesus, I repent of my sins and surrender my life. Wash me clean. I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God, that he died on the cross for my sins and rose again on the third day for my victory. I believe that in my heart and make a confession with my mouth, 
that Jesus is my Savior and Lord. I receive eternal life in Jesus' name. Amen. So we believe that if you prayed that simple prayer that you have been born again, you are starting with a clean slate and you have entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Keep God First in your life and learn to pray. Prayer is simply talking to God like you would talk to a friend, like me talking to you right now. Mark today's date, write it down in your Bible. This is the day of new beginnings in your life. I love you and God loves you. Thank you so much for listening. And I'll speak to you beautiful angels in my next episode. Mwah. 